In this video, we're going to be looking at Chapter 2, and I'm going to be going through the PowerPoint here, talking about all the major uh, topics in the chapter. Um, we'll get as far as we can through this. I don't know if we'll make it all the way through, because this unit, you guys will discover, is probably going to stretch over a couple of weeks, and that's why the due dates for the assignments stretch pretty far. Uh, but we will get as far as we can. So I was just querying the class here asking about all the different programming languages that you already know. And when we think about programming languages, uh, you know, some of the ones that, you know, we really think about, you know, you guys should have touched Visual Basic a little bit. Um, you may have learned PHP. You may have learned a little C Sharp and ASP.NET. Um, you may have learned a little JavaScript, technically not a full-blown programming language, although it's treated as one. Um, and what other languages did we mention? Anything else? A little bit of jQuery. A little bit of jQuery, although that's JavaScript too, but still a programming language. But that covers most of the languages you probably have been exposed to. And depending on what program track you're in, you may have also touched RPG and a couple of other languages. We also had a discussion about um, is SQL a programming language? Not technically. It is a query language. It's a different type of uh, structure. Right here are the objectives for this chapter. So we're going to be looking at basically the different data types um, and variable types that are present in the Java programming language. Now there are some very similar things that you're going to see here to other languages, you know, like integers, for example. Um, and there's some unique quirks that are different than other languages. And you might not really latch on to that right away until you start to learn some of the more advanced concepts, but I'm going to try to make sure it's clear for you. Um, in addition, uh, we'll be looking at that J option pane uh, class, and that is one of the graphical components um, one, and, and one of the methods that you can use to do graphical programming in Java. Now, Java is going through kind of a transformation right now where we're kind of moving from the old GUI programming approach to a new GUI programming approach. The J option pane class is part of what we call the swing slash AWT GUI programming tools. That's a collection of libraries and tools that you can use to make graphical applications. And they have a very particular look to them. And when you create something with those components, you can tell it was written in Java. It looks a little bit different than regular Windows. Now, the, the modern approach is to use what they call Java FX, which renders stuff natively to the Windows environment and looks much better and has some more powerful tools. So if you're learning Java at this point in, in time, you will be looking at that as the graphical environment as opposed to, to Swing and AWT. All right, let's talk about uh, constants. What is a constant? Okay, it is something that does not change, right? Um, notice that they have a couple different names here for them because you probably think of a constant as a constant, right? So you guys have learned about variables. Um, so I'm not going like, to belittle what a variable is. But a constant is something that is not allowed to change. You give it a value and the value stays. Now there's a few different kinds. Notice that, okay, well, numeric constant is different than a literal constant. A literal constant is literally something that is quoted hard-coded into a value. So in other words, we say that if something is holding a value, it's not the result of a computation. Okay? So if I say 5 plus x, or you know, do a formula, and then whatever that happens to be ends up in the constant, that's not a literal constant. A literal constant is one that's a hard-coded value. It literally is this. It's not the result of something happening to it. Um, and then uh, there's this thing called the unnamed constant, which seems kind of strange, because there's no name attached to it, but believe it or not, you can hard code values that are unnamed. Now that is you know, a little bit more of an advanced technique, but not really that much so. All right, now the thing that you know, usually learned in most programming languages first is how to work with variables. Now I always like to use the analogy for a variable where I think of it as a box, right? So I'm going to declare a variable 
and we can create a box, which really is a spot in memory. We're reserving a spot in memory. Then we give that spot a name, and we also say what can go into it. And then if we want, we put something into it. So it's kind of like these components. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to read these bullet points to you, but I think you guys get the point, if, especially if you've worked with other languages. Now, if, let's say you've only worked with JavaScript as a programming language. JavaScript is a language that is not strongly typed. So in other words, I can just say var, give it a name, throw something in there. It could be a string, it could be a number, it could be an integer, it could be a floating point. It, it just takes whatever, it doesn't care. It doesn't care what goes into the box. And then if on one line you give it a number, on the next line you give it a string, it still works. Java, though, is strongly typed, so you have to declare the type you're going to use. You have to plan in advance. So um, it's very important that you understand the, the, the types that it exists. Now, Java also works off of these two concepts. There's what we call the primitive types, and then what you call the reference types. Now, in most languages, some of the constructs that we use, we don't think of them as being a reference type, we just kind of use it. For example, the, the one that you're, that's going to throw you a little bit is a string. A string is really a reference type. It's not a data type. But this is the beauty of Java. A string is actually a class. So when we work with a string, we are pulling upon a library of different things and we're in, invoking it. But whenever you have a class, you can always treat it as a variable. So this is kind of a weird concept. It's just part of the flexibility of the language. All right, so let's take a look at some of these data types. Here's some real common ones. These are all uh, what we call the primitive data types. So there's several different numeric formats. The ones that you are probably going to use most often or almost always are going to be the int for integer, the double for more complex numbers, on occasion character and boolean. Now, there are other ones, and each one of them has a certain type of capacity. And the reason that you would opt to, let's say, use an int as opposed to a byte is if you know in advance that this variable is always only going to hold a one-digit character. So I would choose to use a byte in that circumstance. And the reason you do that is to write an application that runs really efficiently. All right? If you have concerns about memory, and you got like a thousand variables being populated. Sounds weird, but that does happen. That might be a consideration that you put it into a byte structure as opposed to an integer because an integer reserves more memory space. Okay. Now, the thing that's happened in modern computing now is we kind of tend to ignore those things because our computers are so much more capable. The other thing that happens is the operating systems are more intelligent and dynamically adjust memory sizes as needed. So that's why typically we'll use int for integer, double for floating point numbers, and then character and boolean on occasion. Now notice that the character is a single character, single alphanumeric character, so a number or a letter. Notice that string is not on the list. Now if you guys know anything about programming and what an array is, you probably learned what an array is. What a string is, is an array of characters. It's a different thing. Okay. So we leverage that to our advantage. So um, just that's probably the most important difference between Java and other languages. The truth is other languages actually operate the same way, but they consider it a data type as opposed to a reference type. All right. So when you um, do variable declarations, you will need to indicate what your data type is and a name for the object. So um, the other thing that you guys will probably be familiar with is what we call the assignment operator. And I think that what might not be a bad idea here is that I just do some really simple little examples. So if I was to declare an integer, for example, I might just do int uh, number equals one. All right, so this would be our data type. This is the name of the variable 
this is the assignment statement. The general rule with the equal sign is that whatever's on the right gets stored on the left. So we have a variable on the left. Now I can declare a variable and not give it a value right away. So I can do this. So I reserved the spot in memory. I made the box, but I didn't put anything in it. Okay. The other thing that you can do is you can make it so that it's a result of a calculation, which we were mentioning before. Or if you want, you can declare multiple things at the same time. So I can go, and I'm just coming up with nonsense names at this point. So I can declare several of them at the same time. And those can either have values or not have values. That's up to you. Sometimes we plan ahead and we put all our variable declarations at the top of a block of code or at the top of a class. And sometimes we just do them on the fly as we need them. You will find techniques that work for you. And there's certain good practices and certain bad practices. You know. I always like to err on the side of efficiency myself, so it's like if I can find a real efficient way to get something stated, that's what I would prefer. Now, if that confuses you, and that will be the case in some uh, circumstances, then you opt for spelling it all out. Like So, for example, if this technique bedaffles you, don't use it. You know, just avoid it. But you'll find that those simplistic things you know, are meant to help you zoom faster. All right. The word initialization, that's when I just declare a data type and give it a name. We're initiating the object. Okay, the, the assignment, um, well, we just talked about that in associativity. That depends on what operators that we can use with whatever object that we're working with. So if something's a number, or we can do math with it. If it's a character, not really. Right, we can't really do math with it. So that, that's part of the association there. So they give the demonstration here. Basically what I just did is assigning it a type, giving it a name, and then putting a value into it. Always semicolon at the end. Now if we create a constant, we then use the final keyword. Some languages, I know like VB for example, you use what to declare constant? Yeah, C-O-N-S-T. And then there's a convention that people use as well, and this is true in many languages, that when you declare constant that you will prefer to use all capital letters. So for example, if I were to declare a constant here, I would say final int tax rate. And that way, when you're working in the code, you can very quickly identify the fact that it's a constant. Do you have to do it all caps? No, not at all. Not at all. It's just a convention. And it's one that carries across uh, languages. Now, you've probably heard these, these rationales before. Why do you use constants? Well, you, you don't want people to be messing with certain values in a program. So the reason I use tax rate is because if you think about this, right, let's say we write an e-commerce application, right, and it calculates tax. Do you really need to include the tax amount everywhere? No. Do you really want it to be able to change like whenever, like as a result of like some bad code? No. You, you, it's a really good one to have as a you know, specified value that sticks. And then when you do want to change it, you just have one spot to change it and the whole application will adjust. All right, scope is an important concept too. I'm sure you've learned about this in your previous programming classes, but scope refers to the spot within the code in which the variable or the constant is accessible. So 
generally speaking, when something is declared inside a set of curly brackets, its scope is inside those curly brackets. So anything outside those curly brackets cannot access it. Does that make sense? And then the converse is true. Yes? So can you, if you declare, first of all, can you declare your variable array and can you declare your class? Yes. Yes, you can, you can do it that way. That's not always the best practice, though. So if the people listening to the video, the question was, can you declare your variables right after you declare at the beginning of your class? Absolutely. And in some situations, like when we are building a class that will be a blueprint, we do that on purpose. But when we're working within a block of code, it's considered better to declare the variables inside the block of code where you're going to use them. And then instead of using global variables, you pass the values from method to method and class to class. So there's an isolation that happens there, and it makes for better coding. It also makes for portability, which is an important uh, thing. All right, we talked about um, these little functions here, print and print line. If we didn't mention it before. When you do a print statement, it will output whatever you're outputting, and then when it's done, it will leave the cursor right there where it finishes, where print line will output the content and move you down to the next line. So there's circumstances like when you write a prompt, please enter your age. You're going to use a print because it's going to leave you on the line waiting for somebody to type something in. Okay, So you'll see that as you're working. Now. Concatenation is something we were just demonstrating as we were doing uh, the homework, but concatenation is done in this language with a plus sign. And that is really the most common approach to do concatenation. If you learned VB first, that is really the, the true oddball, because that one uses the ampersand to do concatenation. Okay, here's a little hint you guys that do VB. You can use the plus sign, and it works. Most people don't know that. But they don't teach it that way because that's not the formal technique. Now in PHP, and I know a few of you have done PHP, we use what? The period. That's an oddball too. Okay. Um, and I, I, I always say to myself when I'm working with PHP, God, I wish they would just use the plus sign. Because it's, it's very easy to miss a period when you're using it for concatenation. But um, Java is very cool that way. All right, they um, talk about this J option pain thing again, and we just demonstrated that in the homework. Uh, but notice that when we're working with strings, you can have what they call a null string, and that's an empty string. And yes, you can do system out print lines of empty strings. Why? Just to have a blank line. But when it has no value, we consider it null. All right, so here's a little bit of an example where they're working with the graphical component. And like I said, we just saw how this works. But when we were doing it, excuse me, after the null, we were just inserting a whole string. Now what they're showing you here is that you can uh, populate uh, a variable with a value, and then you can concatenate that value to a string. Now this happens to be an empty string here, but you could just as well have some text here and then it would add the number to the end of it and output it. And I think that's pretty common sense, very much like other languages. You can also sandwich it in between several lines of code. Yeah. All right, so they say pitfall, forgetting that a variable holds one value at a time. Yeah, it only holds one value at a time. There's some clever little exercises in the book. I tend not to assign them. There's a couple where I do. Um, where you're kind of trying to figure out what is in memory right now for that variable. Because that's really an important consideration. Um, so you have to like reason through that. So if you're like trying to give something a certain value at a certain point in time, and you're not sure what that value is, a good technique is just to do a little quick output to the console 
Now when we say console, that's the kind of programs we're writing so far. We're writing command line programs. And now gamers, you guys that play video games, right? Most video games have a console mode. You can go in there, you can chat with people or put in commands or whatever it is. Um, that's what a console is. It's a command line uh, interface. You know, actually, I should probably talk about that second bullet. So if you want to actually move the values of two variables, you're going to have to use a third variable to do the switch, right? You can't directly switch them. That's one that you would figure out pretty quick. All right, now they're talking about the data types again, and like I said, most commonly uh, for non-floating point numbers, we will use just int. And you can see here the capability of the values that it can hold. So it can hold, you know, a little over 4 billion values. So if you're going to need a number that's larger than that, that's when you switch to doubles. Okay. Now there's those circumstances where you want something much shorter. You know you're only going to output a certain number of values. Then you start switching to these other ones. We do an exercise um, where we show the differences between those as part of one of the homework assignments. Um, so you see the differences. But generally speaking, you won't be using those too much. All right. Examples for the other ones, what kind of values? So you can see with a byte, remember a byte is a total of eight bits, combination of ones and zeros. And in binary number formats, you have a total of 256 possible values. Thus, negative 128, positive 127, fill the zero in the middle, you have 256 values. Okay, so that's kind of where that comes from. And all of these, in terms of bytes being 8 bits, it shows you how much memory space each one consumes. So a long, which is 8 bytes, is 8 times 8, which is 64. So a string of 64 binary characters and all the combination gives you that many possible values. That's a whole lot more than that 4 billion. So if you're calculating how to get to Mars or something like that, you'd probably use it long because it can hold <laughs> the value that you are needing. All right, Boolean, you guys should know, uh, is basically the true-false value. Um, in uh, Java, we just use the keyword boolean to do it. Other languages sometimes will truncate that to bool. Um, but really, true-false is all you need. You can give it a name. You can pre-populate it with a value if you want. Um, but booleans are very useful. And sometimes booleans are also implied, which we'll see when we get to code, especially when it gets to the point of doing conditional statements. Conditional statements being in the form of like an if statement or a switch statement or something of that sort, or even running a loop, where we test to see if something is true, but we're not necessarily assigning that truth uh, to something that's being stored. Okay. Now, they also start talking about relational operators. These are common constructs in every language as well. There are some notable differences for, for you VB people. So, Notice uh, we got the later, the greater than, less than signs. Notice that the equal to is equal equal, which is different than equal. The single equal sign is for assignment statements. It's for placing values into variables and constants. So it assigns values. For sake of comparison, we use the equal equal, and it tests to see if something is true. So they have true false examples. Here, uh, which is a nice little chart. Uh, we also have the less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. And then in this language, do not equal to, it's exclamation equals. In VB, you guys learn to do bracket, bracket, oddball. That's very unusual. Most programming languages will use the exclamation equals for not. Okay. Remember, it's all to, to test truth or non truth. All right, so floating point numbers, those are numbers with uh, decimal positions. Uh, generally speaking, we'll just use doubles as a rule, um, although there are some 
uh, differences in the capacity, and that also has to do with accuracy. Now, and also the amount of memory that it chews up. So even though doubles tend to hold more value, they're easier to use, and it's also a data construct that transfers between languages. When you guys were doing your VB, you probably learned about doubles and decimals for holding larger values with our floating point. Just a little bit of a correlation there. All right, let's talk about the character data type. As I mentioned before, the character data type holds one single alphanumeric character. That's it. Why would that be useful? Because that is the primitive data type. It's different than a number. Not only is it different than a number, I mean, we tend to think of it as a letter when we say character. But really, anything that's output to a screen or anything that's received as input from a screen, they're all characters. When you take input from a screen and you send it to a program, it goes through a conversion process to become what it needs to be. And the same thing happens when we put it back to the screen. So that's why when we do system out print line, one of the things that's happening is it's taking whatever that thing is and it's converting it to characters that can go on the screen, even if it's a number. So here they show an example where they have single quotes around the character. Can you use double quotes? Why? Maybe I'll leave you with that question. Say that again? They can be used for strings. You can use double quotes for characters too. Some people stick with the convention of single quotes because that way they recognize that it's a character as opposed to a string. But generally speaking, double quotes and single quotes can be used interchangeably as long as you're consistent with what you're doing. You can. But like I said, it's a convention that people use single quotes for characters because that way they identify the fact that it's a character. Um, but whatever you do, um, you have to be consistent with the usage. So I can't start with a single quote and end with a double. It won't work. All right. Strings, notice, are a built-in class. We've already been using them, and one of the ways that we know it's a class, it starts with a capital letter. That indicates to you in Java that right away it's a class. So a string is really an array of characters. I said that before. So we also have this uh, thing called an escape sequence, and that's where we use a backslash and then a certain character in order to be able to render output um, without rendering the character that we're using. So if I have a string of text and I want to have the text go to a next line, I would put slash n and then on the screen when it outputs, it'll after that character, it will drop down. So they're using kind of like a, a really weird uh, implementation of it, but this is what we call an escape sequence. And there's different ones. There's ones for new lines and, uh, you know, for tabs and carriage returns and all these weird things. And you'll get to, to know them. The ones that we'll use most often will be for a new line and to escape quotes. Because very often, you know, you want to, output a double quote inside of quotes, that's kind of weird, right? So you have to use an escape sequence in order to be able to put the quote inside an output, because otherwise it thinks the string's over. Okay. All right, so here's a listing of the this common, we should say, escape sequences. Um, you may try all of these, but I, I know from experiences that the, um, the one that you're going to use most often will be the N, and the double quotes, generally speaking, maybe the single quotes once in a while. But there's a whole array of them, and you can goof around with those a little bit and figure out how they work. All right, so one thing that we haven't tried yet is getting input from the user when they're running a console program. We have used J Option Pane to output information, and I don't remember if you guys had to do an exercise where you used the J option pane to grab information. Did you guys do that? No, not yet. 
but you can use that mechanism to grab information. But when you're working on a command line for our console, we use what we call the scanner class. So in order to grab input, we are, we are going to have to do an import statement that brings in the library that allows us to do that. The scanner is the class that will read the stuff from the keyboard and then store it in a temporary position and then from there we can put it into a variable or use it directly. So in order to grab input from the keyboard, we must invoke the scanner class. And it says normally it's the keyboard for input. Now once you have the scanner class in place, you also need to know when you're grabbing that information what type of information it is and what you're going to do with it. So for example, if I have a prompt that says, what is your age, you're not expecting a string, right? You're expecting an integer. So in order to grab that information, you would use the next int method to grab that integer. Now, I know this is a little vague right now, but we'll walk through examples and you'll see it in, in action. Um, so you'll do that and you'll basically um, grab whatever stuff you need based on the data type. Um, once again, just based on experience, uh, the ones that you're going to use most often will be these first four. Double int, next line, and just next. Right, here's a little example of the scanner class. Notice the import statement at the top. It is part of the core Java libraries, but you do have to import it to use it. All right, so you have to have that import statement at the top. That's one of those import statements you probably get to memorize because you use it quite a bit. Um, once we have it in place, um, and this is your first real glimpse at like working with objects here, um, although our next chapter is where we formally talk about it, but what we're doing is, notice how we're using scanner almost the same way that we would use a declaration for a variable. So what we're doing is we're creating a new scanner object based upon the import class. Okay, so we have basically like an archetype of a scanner that exists in this library. We are then calling upon it to make a new one just like we do an integer. So really the, the kind of the functional equivalent here, and I'm going to kind of get my code window over here so you can see a comparison, because you can also do things like this. <coughs> Excuse me. That type of thing. So when we're doing a, an integer declaration in the background, something like this is happening. Now, when you look at this statement, that's exactly what's happening. So we're giving, we're making an, what they call an instance. We're making uh, an object that can hold the input from the keyboard, okay, on the fly. So we're doing that. We're giving it a name. We're saying that we have a new scanner, and the input's coming from the system from the keyboard. I know it's a little weird at first, so basically initially you'll just memorize this and go, yeah, this is how I do it. And the next part of that is typically that you'll do a prompt. Remember when I said um, if your prompt is there and you want the cursor to stay at the end of the line, you use a print. So here's an example. Please enter your name. It's waiting for you to put something in. And then when you type something in and press enter, this is what happens. Input device, which is our scanner, uses the next line, which is what we use to grab the text. And then it takes all that and stores it in a string variable that we declared above. So we created a scanner, gave it a name, we put out a prompt, user presses enter, the scanner object grabs it, realizes what kind of data type it's sending it to, and then stores it in a variable. So it doesn't go from like prompt directly to a variable. There's some steps that happen in between. But this is the technique, and you'll learn to memorize this. It's not a big deal. You won't remember it at first, but 
trust me, by like week four or five or six, you'll be an expert with it. And you'll probably be correcting me on my mistakes. All right, here they talk about how this works. Uh, I'm not so concerned about the nitty gritty, uh, but whenever you type something into a keyboard, and you guys should realize this, the keyboard itself on system level has what they call a buffer, a little memory buffer. And a really good indicator of that, um, most of you probably don't type fast enough to overrun the buffer on your systems, especially on modern computers. But in the old days, it was not uncommon that we would you know, be working on like a 486 or something really old like that. We'd fire up Microsoft Word, and then you get these people that can type 100 words a minute, and they're like, and then they look up at the screen, and the letters are still coming out. And that's the keyboard buffer, because it can only handle so much so quick, and then and translate it from the keyboard, grabbing it, and then putting it into the program that you want. So there's the temporary storage location that happens with all text input like that. So they talk about the J option pane here and how to do the input. Um, there's not a lot of assignments where I use this, and I think I've already explained why, because it's really more the old-fashioned graphical approach. Um, the, this book does have chapters on doing GUI stuff, um, and we're not going to get that far in this book. It's just a few chapters beyond where we're going to get. But I would encourage you, if you're interested, that it's not a bad technology to learn, even though it's becoming outdated, because some of the work that's out there when you go into programming is working with legacy systems. Right? People already have software in place, and then you need to learn how to work with it. If you're doing modern development these days, almost all of it is in Java FX. That's just, that's just the tool we use. The other big thing with Java is instead of outputting into a operating system environment where we run things in native Windows, uh, Windows, <laughs> um, we output to the web browser. That's a big thing too. Uh, and that's a different way. To work. So this is a little information on that and a little bit of an example. Um, and notice though, uh, instead of doing an output, how you do the input, you do need the class imported. And then instead of uh, show message dialog, you have, you have a show input and you, this is your prompt and it will put a little box in there that you can type into and then they click OK and then it gets grabbed. And where is that put? It's put into result. So whenever you're working with anything that's grabbing input, and this is important, it needs to have somewhere to go. You can't just grab the input and leave it there. It might be in the, in the buffer, but it's not stored anywhere. And it needs to be stored in memory before you can do something with it. And there's an example of what it would look like. And I always laugh. Whenever I see a dialog that says OK and cancel, I think of like, you know, old Windows security, like you'd log into like Windows 98, please enter your username and password, right? Okay, or cancel. You hit cancel, you're in. There's like basically no security. So, I don't know why they even had it. All right, so uh, they kind of continue on this path and I'm not really too concerned with it. Um, but let's move on to this next slide. It says that each uh, primitive data type has a corresponding class contained in the Java language package. So in other words, when we are working with certain data types, they have their primitive uh, values, <coughs> but they also have built into the language more advanced class libraries that attach to that data type that allow you to do more advanced functions with it. So we can say int to do an integer, and we can also say integer to do an integer. And if you do the integer, it has different capabilities than the regular int. In other words, there's a whole bunch of things that are attached to it. And if, for example, in this uh, case, they show like how to parse things. And that's a great keyword. What does it mean to parse? Somebody Google it really quick. What does it mean to parse? What is parse? Parse is 
Yes, you guys. <laughs> Wikipedia is fine, because that would be the first thing that comes back. Okay. Analyze a sentence or a code into its parts and look at the syntax of what it's doing. So when we're parsing something, we are reading through it. We're gathering the information. That's what parsing is. All right. Now with the J option pane, aside from the little dialog boxes we worked with, they also have confirm dialog boxes. Those of you that have worked with JavaScript, that'll look very familiar because you have like alert boxes and confirm boxes and same type of thing. Uh, once again, I'm not too uh, worried about those. This is what they look like. So they got a yes, no, cancel. All right, let's go to the arithmetic part. Um, the operators within Java are very similar to just about every programming language. And I know that you guys use um, Visual Basic and there's some real odd quirks in that language mathematically. Some of them are actually kind of cool. But these are our basic... Uh, operations. So all the, you know, add, subtract, multiply, divide. Then we have the, the modulus operator. In VB you would actually say mod, M-O-D. Here you just use the percent sign. That is the convention in just about every language. That is remainder division. And they have a little example there. So it says 45 mod 2 is equal to 1. So it's not how many times it goes in, it's what's left over. And then the question I always get is, well, what do you, what's mod good for? Very simple, making change. Making change. So how many times is, uh, if you have, let's say, uh, you can hand somebody a dollar and something costs 80 cents, how do you make change on that? Blank stairs, right? Well, what will, you guys know what the answer is, right? Because you're just subtracting 80 from 100. But with coins, they're, they're in this pre-configured, you know, quantities. So can I give change of 20 cents with a quarter? All right. So if I did 20 mod 25, this doesn't even work, right? So you, you keep going down to the point where it's like, can I do 20 mod 10? Yes. What's the remainder? Zero. There's no more change to give. Right? So that, that's kind of one of the techniques. I know that was a very quick um, description of it. It's better to see it in action. Um, uh, order of operations applies uh, in this language like any other. You guys know the little PEMDA acronym, right? Which stands for? Right. And those of you that didn't hear it at home, say it real loud, Hayden. Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. Yes, in that order. So that's the way that you set up your equations. I always tell people when you're doing order of operations and you're not sure how to do it because some people can see it real easily like multiplication and division and addition next to each other. Just put parentheses around things or make it longhand. Do it in two statements instead of one statement. No reason you have to uh, force it. So they show here uh, some approaches to doing calculations and you know I will argue that the efficiency and inefficiency of their examples here are really kind of not necessarily the best thing. Um, what is nice, though, is with the second one, because hours times rate is really your gross pay, it makes more sense syntactically as you're writing your code. And that way, when you look at it, oh, it's gross pay times the state rate. Okay, okay I get it. All right, this, this is where it gets a little interesting. Integers are whole numbers. Floating points have decimals. What happens when we start to combine those two? 
we start to do math with them. In VB, you had what they called integer division as opposed to remainder division. And if you guys noticed, I kind of glossed over that a couple slides ago. So in other words, in VB, you had like your slash going one way as regular division, like the forward slash. But if you did a backslash, it would give you integer division. And integer division is where it tells you how many times it goes into it, but doesn't worry about the remainder. So you don't get a decimal. So 3 integer division 2 is 1. Okay, it doesn't make any sense, right? Um, but what happens when you're combining the two numeric types is we get what they call casting. All right. I know it's a little fuzzy, but we'll see that coming up. All right. Here's where we start to talk about it, and we'll call it type conversion. And you can see the second bullet says operations with operate, operands of unlike types. Java chooses the type that it's going to become. So in some cases when you're doing math, you need to know in advance what Java is going to do with it to get the answer that you want. And there's a couple of assignments that you're going to have that start to take it, and you'll do the math, and you're doing some division, and you're expecting a 0.5, and it only gives you the whole number. And then you got to leverage it by changing your data types in order to make it work. And knowing that and how it works in advance will will help you. All right, so this is just a re real quick list of some of the uh, conversions. All right, so it says the order for establishing unifying types between two variables is in, in order of preference, doubles, down through the floating points to the, the larger and then the smaller integer types. All right. This is referred to as typecasting, and I, I think, already talked about uh, what that is. So I'm kind of skipping over that one, too. So you are going to find uh, in the exercise when you see it happen, that's where the clarity will come. Mess with it, play with it, and then you'll see the output. So we're basically at the end of the chapter here. Um, so they're just kind of doing a recap of things you should do things you shouldn't do. I'm not a big fan of these slides, so I go over them really quick. Um, and these are some of the things that we learned very quickly. And that's it. That wraps this video. Now we're going to move on to do some exercises.